nice jingle. <laughs> Thanks, Ola, for the intro. Uh, yes, just some uh, quick uh, thoughts on, uh, on the Valley. I've been there for three years now, um, but before that I was in New York for five years. Like every correspondent uh, was in New York for the past 60 years. Um, but then in, in 2012, as the financial crisis was winding down, we figured something is changing. The center of the world economy doesn't seem to be the banking world anymore. So we moved, after 60 years, we moved our, um, we moved our correspondence post uh, to San Francisco. And this is really a sign of the times, how things are changing. And I'm not the only one. Uh, when I arrived, the New York Times had a few people, but not that many. But now they have a dozen. The same goes for the Wall Street Journal. So everybody's building up bureaus and offices, and every journalist in the country seems to be moving to the Silicon Valley. And this is only happening naturally because everybody only wants to hear about tech these days. There's really a lot of things changing. So the cliche is that it's really hard to learn about tech companies. That probably comes from Apple being a black box. And you really hear all these stories, how they never tell anything and talk about anything. But actually, the opposite is true. I've never had an easier time reporting. Um, all these tech companies are actually really, really open. So uh, case in point, uh, Facebook. So every few months or so, they, they have a little barbecue party on the lawn of the headquarter. And all they do is they invite a couple of journalists, and then they have like 10, 12, 15 executives coming over, including Mark, as you can see here. And you can have a beer and a burger and an ice cream with him and talk with him for two hours about whatever you want. Uh, it's off the record, but you can pick his brain. And of course, you learn a lot, and you get their strategy, and you really know what they're thinking of. This is relevant in the way that this is just not an anecdote, but it reflects on the culture of the valley. And this is also important for every company coming there, especially from Europe, who are not used to the unorthodox and open networking culture they have there. If you want to do business there, you have to get used to this kind of way of doing business. So second case in point is Google. Um, also a place where everybody's saying, oh, behind their dark fortress, they're working on, you know, uh, uh, being the kings of the world, but actually also the opposite is true. Um, over two years I was able to do over a hundred interviews and uh, I uh, met Larry Page about three times for long interviews and they really supported uh, uh, me having an insight in the, on the company and having a deep look in all the, um, all the laboratories and what they're working on. So this is really relevant in the way of that more and more companies are learning that there's things happening in the valley, but you can also really get access, learn from these companies, not copy them, but get some important lessons to move ahead faster as well. So in the past about 18 months, the valley seemed to have turned into kind of a Disney resort for top executives, that at least that's what it feels like to me. I see every week another travel group from a big European company coming in, 20 executives trying to learn what's going on. And there's more and more outposts opening up. So yeah, Mercedes, that might make sense. But there's also Munich Re, the, uh, the industry uh, insurance giant, who opened up an office. And then there's AWE, the energy giant, they opened up an office. The Deutsche Bank is just about opening an office. So there's dozens of them. So everybody's going there. Why are they doing that? Because they're trying to learn something not about the product, but most of them are really trying to learn something about what's being done differently in the Valley in the way of philosophy, business culture, and organizational structures. And the latter thing is maybe surprising, but that's a really relevant point these days. You all heard about the cliches, about the sushi, and the bowling, and the, and the, the volleyball, and all these things. But, and yes, uh, Apple does have an oyster bar, as you can see for all its uh, employees, where you get free oysters every day. This sounds nice, but it's not a gimmick. They do it on purpose. Why do they do that on purpose? Because these days, competition for workers, for good workers, for engineers, for top managers are global, and it's not about money in the end. It's about having a happy worker, or at least giving the worker an illusion of being happy. So if you want to get the best people, you may have to do a little more than just paying them money. So you have work and life overlapping on purpose. That's the new Google headquarters as it's planned. You can see in, you know, the, in the central and the rendering is not you know, computer workstations, but a yoga class. So that's what everybody is working on, because if you want to get the best people, you have to do that. And if you come in from Europe, 
you will have to start thinking about the same things at some point because if all the best engineers from Zurich or from Berlin or whatever are actually being approached from these companies over there and everybody's paying the same money and they say, hey, we give you all these free things and you, we make you a happy life, then they might go there. And, and I see that happening over the past two years. I see a, a big stream of the best German engineers and Swiss engineers actually go into the valley and this will be a big problem in the long run. But in the end, you know, everything's about money. So let's talk about money for a second here. So venture capital tier one in billions, US 50 billion, Europe 5 billion. And that's actually a, a big increase in the number. Most of you think, oh, I know that. But I, think about it again for a second because I see it every day. If you have a good idea in the US, you get 200 million. If you have the same idea in Europe, you get 2 million. Who's gonna win that race? And we are only seeing the beginnings of that, how this is a problem. So then the other thing the Valley always shows, it's not about money only, it's about having the big ambitions. So Larry Page always says, you know, every company has been doing the same over and over and over again that bores me. Incremental steps are leading nowhere. You need big leaps, no small steps. So they're saying 10x, so everything's 10 times faster, 10 times bigger, not 10%. But this is really hard to do. The question is where it leads us. Right now, you're seeing a lot of things happening in, in deep learning, machine learning. Those are the things that are happening, and that's not at Apple or Google, that's at Bosch and Siemens and Mercedes as well. So what does it mean? It means software is eating the world is really true. It's, an, it's actually an old saying by now from Mark Andreessen, but it turns out to be true. But what does it mean, in, at least in the short term? Um, I guess the first big test case will be the self-driving car and the way of that it pits the old economy and the new economy against each other in a completely new way. It's the question who's gonna win this race. There's a lot of people saying this is gonna be the death of the auto industry. I don't believe that, but it's gonna be very interesting to see. So for the past eight months, I took actually a bunch of test rides at, in the Google car, in the Mercedes car, in the Audi self-driving cars. And I can tell you it's amazing and it's gonna change how we live. And it's not gonna be in 20 years or in 15, it's gonna be by 2019, everybody's zooming in on that kind of time frame. Three more years. And it's gonna be interesting to see because the uh, car industry has taken a more evolutionary approach, saying okay, we bring all the new features in, uh, one after the other, and then we're gonna have a really fully autonomous car by 2025. And Google and Apple has taken a completely different approach and saying we're gonna build from scratch a completely new car. Um, and this is going to be a very interesting to see who's going to win that race because it's going to be a symbol for how, how the economy is going to look like in the next 10 to 15 years. So, but if you look back 20 years, it would have been unthinkable that Apple actually builds a car. Or maybe not. And I think the best person to talk uh, to us about that probably is John Scully. Because he's been at uh, Apple for a long time. He's been the CEO for 10 years. Uh, he grew the company from 800 million to 8 billion. Um, he's been a leader in tech for more than 30 years. After leaving Apple, he was leading or founding comp more than 15 companies. He was on the board of several other companies. He helped tons of startups off the ground. So he has a lot of insight and a lot of lessons to tell. He actually wrote a book. I can really recommend you get it. It's called Moonshot. Uh, and it's about how to build a billion dollar company for the 21st century. So I hope he's going to share some of these insights with us today and make us a little wiser. So please, everybody, John Scully. Thanks for making all the way over here. Thanks for taking time. Great, nice to be um, here, Tom. You joined Apple in, in 1983 when the board decided that Steve Jobs needs some help. And he was okay with it as long as he could pick the CEO. And 
He wanted only you, and I think he tried to lure you over for more than a year. What, what did he do to finally convince you? Well, the real story is that Steve had wanted to be the CEO himself. Uh, I didn't know that at the, at, at the time they recruited me, but they had actually uh, told Steve that they didn't think he was ready to be a CEO. And they, because he was the chairman of the board, the largest shareholder, the co-founder of the company, they said, you can have a veto right over whom we recruit. Mm. So they went through all the logical candidates in Silicon Valley, and Steve turned them all down. And then finally, uh, David Rockefeller, the Rockefeller family were uh, among the earliest investors in Apple, he said, well, why don't we try a different part of the country, a different industry, and maybe we can find someone to see we'll, we'll agree to. And so they went to the most famous executive search person at that time, Jerry Roach, on, uh, in New York. And he turned up my name, and Steve and I met. Uh, I'd never heard of Silicon Valley at that time. I was running Pepsi. Uh, most people had not heard of Silicon Valley unless you lived in Silicon Valley. Uh, and Steve and I spent about five months getting to know one another, and, and uh, we would meet almost every weekend. And finally, at the end of March of 1983, we'd met first in 1982, we're standing on the terrace of Steve's new apartment, which was on Central Park West. It's now owned by Bono, uh, it's a triplex apartment. And we're looking out towards the Hudson River, and I said, Steve, thought about it, but I'm not coming to Apple. I said, uh, I'll yeah, be an advisor for free, but uh, I think I'll stay where I am. And he was dressed in his blue jeans and running shoes, and black turtleneck sweater, except in those days he had very black hair. Remember, he was 26 years old. And he got about half a meter from me and just stared at me. And this long pause, and then he said, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? <laughs> <laughs> or do you want to come with me and change the world? And it's like it knocks the wind out of you. And that was what Steve Jobs was like. He just had that ability to come up with this incredible right thing to say at a moment when he thought he was going to lose something. And I didn't give him a different answer at that moment, but a week later I was working at Apple. Well, what, what kind of company was Apple in 1983? We all know the big giant with all these great ideas and the big visions. How was it in the 80s when it started? Well, when I showed up in Silicon Valley for the first time, and this was actually before I joined Apple, uh, but the first time I met Steve, uh, I remember we didn't have GPS back in uh, 1982. So I'm driving my self-drive car, looking at the map, trying to figure out where Cupertino is, you know, come into this area, and I said, gee, I must be in the wrong place because it's just a bunch of houses mm -hmm. and some uh, one-story tilt-up buildings. And it turned out I wasn't in the wrong place. That was Apple. Uh, and so in uh, a little tiny house, uh, was where I first met him. Uh, that wasn't where he worked. He actually worked across the street in a one-story tilt-up. Uh, that was, uh, I remember the first impression I had was looking up on the roof and there was a, a pirate flag flying on the building and that was the Mac building. Uh, when I went in, they had put together a, a demo for me, which was, there was no Macintosh then. It was just a, 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 a picture tube and a bunch of you know, parts across a, a bench top, and a fellow named Andy Hertzfeld had put together a little dancing Pepsi cans on the, on the screen of this picture tube, and he was there with a big Cheshire smile on his face. I couldn't figure out why, because I didn't know that was hard to have dancing Pepsi cans on a, on a computer screen. And uh, <clears throat> that was the first time I saw uh, Macintosh and the first time I, I met, met Steve. But we had many meetings between then and when I finally joined. But it's, uh, Silicon Valley uh, was probably a surprise to most people in those days because it, it, you could easily drive right past it and not even know you were there. Mm -hmm. it, it, there, there were no big fancy buildings. It wasn't glass towers as you'd see in Dubai or someplace like yeah. that. It was a place where engineers used to hang out. When you came in there and you saw the first Max, what was your first thought, this is going to be huge? Or was it like, oh, this is a big bet, we'll see what's going to happen? Well, I had no prior computer experience, but uh, I had given 
a talk in 1978 at Harvard Business School about the Pepsi challenge. Young student comes up to me afterwards and he says, John, I got something I want to show you. I put it together just for you coming to talk to us about the Pepsi challenge. And I said, okay. I said, what, where is it? He said, well, it's actually in another building. So we walk across, uh, I don't know if you know the Harvard Business School campus, campus, but there are several buildings there. So we walk over to another building and in the building is a room with a Apple II computer. Now, 1978, there were no floppy disk drives. Steve Wozniak had not invented the disk drive at that point. It was a tape recorder and a little tiny television screen. There were no computer displays uh, for personal computers in those days. And so I'm looking at this thing and there are rows and columns of numbers after we booted up the screen. I said, well, what do you call it? He said, well, I call it a spreadsheet. And that was Dan Bricklin and Dan Bricklin uh, and his uh, partner, Bob Frankston, and another fellow named Dan Feilstra, uh, created the first spreadsheet. And I got to see it. Uh, and they did it for the Pepsi Challenge. And that was uh, something that uh, a couple of years later, when it actually became commercial, I bought every Pepsi bottler, an Apple II uh, computer, uh, on the condition that, by then, Woz had invented the floppy disk drive, uh, that they would send in their sales results to me uh, every week in a, in a little envelope because uh, it had taken us typically three to four months to get the sales results just through uh, snail mail. Mm. So that was my first experience with a, a personal computer. And then, of course, the, uh, when Steve told me that um, you know, it was going to be a huge industry, I sort of said, well, <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> I, I, I didn't quite honestly understand. But here was the interesting thing to me, was that in all the times that I was with, with Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, and Bill used to come down you know, fairly frequently to see what Steve was working on, and I can remember the first time we were all together, and it tended to be late at night because engineers don't show up till about the middle of the day in Silicon Valley, as you know, and so they're there usually till one in the morning. So we're sitting around the Mac lab. Uh, remember, the average age of the entire team that built the Macintosh was 22. And <laughs> we're sitting there, and uh, Steve and Bill are talking about the noble cause. Now, I came from an industry where there was no noble cause. I, was, I came from the soft drink industry, and, and I was a, a, a veteran of the cola wars. So it was all about competition. There wasn't anything about noble cause with soft drinks. Right. And here, uh, Bill and Steve talking about a noble cause that they're going to change the world, and they're going to build an entirely new industry that didn't exist. So it wasn't a war so much as building something that didn't exist. And it was all about giving tools, productivity tools, for knowledge workers. Peter Drucker, um, the great business strategist uh, years before, it talked about this new information economy and there'd be knowledge workers. Well, these two geniuses, Bill and, uh, Gates and Steve Jobs, were going to change the world one person at a time with what Steve used to call bicycles for the mind. And at, there wasn't a single meeting that I ever had where Steve and Bill, that they ever talked about making money. It was always about the noble cause. Now, they had two completely different ideas, Tom, about how to do it, and they, were, they would fight most of the time, because Steve said it was all about keeping it proprietary, hardware and software. He didn't want anyone else messing around with it, because it was all about the user experience. And Bill saying, no, people can do it that, what they want as long as they buy my software, and Bill was the one who invented shrink wrap software. But so it's the, two it's different the strategies. Is the Steve Jobs from the 2000s that most of us know better because he was more in the media the same Steve Jobs that he was in the 80s? All of the vision that he had that we all got to see uh, in, the, in the late 90s, in the 2000s, um, Steve had all those ideas back in those early days when, when um, I first met him. Um, he was thinking about the industry differently than anybody else. You know, Silicon Valley in the 1980s was about invention. But the people I knew then were people like Bob Noyce, who invented the integrated circuit, and Andy Grove, and, and Gordon Moore, you know, Moore's Law, who were running Intel, and uh, you know, people who were creating the first usable internet, which was called the ARPANET, and uh, people like Bob Kahn, and, and Vince Cerf, and 
uh, you know, the, the founders of Adobe, you know, John Warner and Chuck Geschke, and all, it was an era of tools. You know, people were building the tools. The things we all take for granted now, there were geniuses back then um, who were actually creating all this stuff, and that's what Silicon Valley was like. Well, then along comes Steve Jobs, and he actually wasn't an engineer. Uh, he didn't know how to build a computer. Woz was the, was the genius of, who actually built the computers, but Steve saw a different direction. He said that these machines, someday, Moore's Law, are gonna become powerful enough and inexpensive enough that it's all gonna be about consumers. And the reason he recruited me, because I didn't know about how to build a computer, was that he loved the Pepsi advertising. We did something called Pepsi Generation and then Pepsi Ch Challenge. And I used to say, Steve, you know, it's uh, <clears throat> perception leads reality. It's all about the experience, and we call it experience marketing. And he said, that's what we have to learn how to do, because I'm building this machine for creative people called Macintosh, didn't exist at that point, and it's gonna be a creative tool for people who don't know anything about technology. I'm gonna make it that simple to use, and we've gotta be able to tilt the whole industry in an entirely different direction. And of course he did, and we saw that, you know, um, all the way up to the end of his life. You guys were close friends for a long time, and then it kind of ended in bad blood because the board actually forced Steve out. The legend goes that you forced him out, which is not true, which the board actually did. Right. But did you guys ever reconcile? Did you? Well, I mean, you have to sort of understand what the early Steve Jobs was like. Uh, and the early Steve Jobs was a, a genius in all of the ways that his life has been celebrated. That's all completely accurate. Um, he saw where things were going, but he also was uh, called the, the, the man who lived in the reality distortion field. Yes. And so he didn't always accept the laws of physics, uh, meaning that it wasn't that he was smart, wasn't smart enough to accept the laws of physics, it was that he was so certain about where things were going that it was frustrating to him that the technology to do these things was just not ready. So uh, when the first Mac came out, we introduced it with a lot of fanfare with a commercial at the Super Bowl and it was, you know, got a lot of people excited, but when they started using the product, it didn't do very much. Um, Moore's Law, processors weren't very powerful. And a year later, we introduced the uh, Macintosh office that had uh, the first computers with plug and play, networking, the first laser printing. Again, Moore's Law, it didn't do very much. And it, and it drove Steve nuts and he got depressed. And so he was much more emotional than you've ever seen him in any of the, of the movies. Uh, some of the movies try to make him out, Tom, a little bit of a monster. It, it, it isn't really accurate. Uh, Steve uh, was emotional, uh, he could you know, take some positions that people found, you know, were difficult to accept. But at the same time, um, people loved working for him. Mm. And so he made choices in life and he, he didn't care about friends. Okay. Uh, at the time that he and I were friends, I, I was, I'd say, clearly his closest friend because we were together seven days a week. We, we you know, talked about everything in, in, in life. And he was a, a, a very, very rich um, intellect in terms of music and you know, things he read and he was very spiritual. He spent time in India and, and he, he was a much uh, you know, fuller personality than you see presented in, in movies. But <laughs> the thing that was um, so difficult for him, I think, was uh, when the board told him to step down from running the Macintosh division. He was never, never fired because they felt he was being disruptive. Uh, and he was trying to shift, he was trying to get me to shift the, the money from the Apple II, the only cash flow of the company, over to the Macintosh and to drop the price of the Mac, which we felt would, would uh, bankrupt the company. Uh, he never forgave me for that. And Steve lived in a world of black and white. There, was, there were no grays. You know, you were either over here or you were over there. And, and uh, to, to the end of his life, he never forgave me for not standing up for him uh, at the board. So he was never fired. 
Uh, I never fired him, uh, but he was, uh, you know, very, very bitter uh, towards me that uh, I didn't stand up for him, you know, when he wanted to make those changes that I thought would, for a public company, we just couldn't do. You're, you're a major character in, in the Hollywood movie about Steve Jobs that came out a while ago and that won uh, a couple of Golden Globes. And uh, you're actually played by Jeff Daniels, yes. so <laughs> congrats to that. Um, did they actually come and pick your brain and uh, talk to you about before they wrote the script? Uh, they, well, I never knew anything about the script. They, they never revealed the script. Um, I did meet with Aaron Sorkin. My wife, Diane, and I uh, met, met with him several times. Uh, we met with... Uh, Jeff Daniels, uh, Michael Fassbender, so you know, most of the cast. Uh, they talked to Waz as well. Uh, didn't tell any of us what the script was. We didn't know what the movie would end up being like until we actually saw, saw the movie our, ourselves. Um, and it's won a lot of awards, Golden Globe nominated for Oscars. But as Aaron Sorkin you know, did point out to us at the time we were talking to him, he said, I'm not trying to make a biopic about Apple. This is not the history of Apple. It's not the full story of Steve Jobs. It was really about, if you've seen the film, uh, it's about the relationship of uh, Steve with Chris Ann, his former girlfriend, and the mother of his uh, first daughter, Lisa. And it's about the, um, he wasn't perfect, we're all imperfect. Uh, and it was about the imperfect relationship that he, he had with his daughter, Lisa. But it, it's, it's pretty, Uh, narrow, and it gets a lot of people in Silicon Valley unhappy because there was a lot more to Steve Jobs than what comes through in that, in that movie. When you left Apple, you, you had grown the company tenfold. Are there, what are the lessons you took with you when you went on in your tech career? Is there anything you said, well, that I learned there, and I'm going to apply that to whatever I do now? Well, I have uh, stayed in the tech industry. I don't run companies. I haven't. Uh, but I help found companies. I help... Uh, uh, CEOs build companies, uh, uh, they tend to have some marketing uh, or con consumer aspect to it. So uh, one of the ones I was very involved with was called Metro PCS, uh, which we built up to about $9 billion dollars and sold to T-Mobile uh, as one of the largest wireless operators in, in, in the U.S. Uh, the, the things I'm working on now, I have a, about uh, over a dozen companies that I'm involved with. Uh, again, always as a, a mentor, investor, what we call in the States a rainmaker, which means you know, bringing in the capital, helping recruit the talent, uh, helping with relationships, helping sell the companies you know, when we reach that point. And so I'm very much involved now with um, taking the technologies that were developed by uh, many of the young geniuses in Silicon Valley today who are in their 30s, um, like Facebook, like Google, uh, which essentially have taken the cloud, they have scaled it, they vetted the technology, it's now reliable, and it's really, really inexpensive. And so we're taking those technologies now and we're going into large established industries. So uh, a noble cause I'm involved with is uh, trying to help uh, revolutionize the U.S. healthcare system. So that's three trillion dollars of, of sales every, every year, unsustainable, doesn't cover everybody uh, with health care in, in the U.S. And so uh, we're focused on the largest cost in the health care system, which are pharmaceuticals. And we built the first cloud-based pharmacy benefit management company called RX Advance. We just launched it this year. To give you an idea how fast these companies grow, uh, this is the first cloud system for um, Yeah, being able to take about 40% of the cost out of the people who compete in this $300 billion dollar segment of uh, pharmaceuticals and various services around it. Uh, we'll do $400 million of um, contracted revenue this year, our first year, and we're forecasting uh, uh, somewhere between a billion and a half to a billion eight next year. So these things ramp very, very quickly, you know, and they get profitable very fast. We're doing the same thing in marketing tech. I co-founded a company called Zeta. Interactive, uh, which we just bought uh, eBay's uh, CRM business, uh, customer relationship management. We're now up to about 1,000 employees and we're the largest uh, marketing cloud company that's, that's not owned by Salesforce or Oracle. Or, um, and then we are doing the same thing in FinTech. We're building one of the largest um, consumer credit companies that enables people to 
uh, get their credit scores uh, improved, um, which is an incredibly horrible customer experience if, if you've ever had to go through it. Uh, um, in the US, if you have a credit score of 640, and you go out to get a high ticket item like buy an automobile or purchase a house, uh, your interest rates are gonna be over 20%. And yet, if you could get your credit score up to 740, 100 points higher, your interest rates will drop by 10 points. And, and a lot of people have the credit worthiness to be a 740 as opposed to a 640, but this resolution dispute can take months and months because there's no good technology. It's all built on technology that's 25 years old. So we're doing all of that on the cloud. And it's just, I think, an indication, and you mentioned this in your opening remarks, Tom, is that uh, the cloud is affordable for everything. We're repurposing it now into big, established industries. But what are we putting on top of it? It's all deep learning. It's all machine learning. And that's the single biggest thing that I see going on that's different today than you know, what it's been for the last 30 years. Do you think the financial services industry is ready for that? Well, or are they going to be run over by everybody from Silicon well, Valley? Uh, I've been involved with the financial service industry for a while because I, I believe that um, it's all about having domain expertise. So you pick uh, industries where you can get domain expertise. So for instance, in healthcare, I've been in it for 10 years and we have five companies. In financial services, I've been in it for a good number of years, going back even further. And we built several companies, um, you know, some public like, like Intralinx um, and um, Credit Trade, which we, sol we sold to ICE, which is you know, um, a multi-billion dollar company. And so, what you see in something like uh, financial services is that first the banks look at it and they say, gee, that's kind of a curious thing you're working on. And then you get to another stage where they say, gee, that looks like it's actually useful. And then you get to a stage where they say, wow, <laughs> you know, that's going to be pervasive. And that's really where the banking industry is today uh, with fintech. And, and today in FinTech, there are probably 20 companies that have market values, starting with like Credit Karma, about three and a half billion US dollars, to companies like Experian that are over $20 billion, and companies like Lending Club that are about $8 billion. So there are a lot of unicorn companies that have real business models. The banks are taking them seriously. In, in Europe, everyone's focused on what's called Basel III you know, regs, which is about the amount of capital reserve you have in a bank. In the US, it's all about Dodd-Frank. The result is the banks are narrowing their focus of what they, the regulators will allow them to work on. And a lot of the things that might have been done by banks in the past are now being done by the new startups in FinTech, yeah. a lot out of London, as an example, and uh, a lot of, out of the US. So, um, I think people are taking fintech very seriously because they don't want to see what happened to music industry and happened to the newspaper industry, happened to the banks. And um, it, it's very possible there are going to be some revolutionary changes that are, that, are, that are going on in fintech. You've been involved with the tech industry now for three decades. Um, does it feel to you that we're nearing an inflection point where all the progress from the last 20, 30 years is coming together and it's really taken off now? Well, I, I don't think of it just like that. I think of it this way. If you look back on the entire time that I've been in the high-tech industry, which goes back to the, to the early 80s, that there's been a common mission by everybody, regardless of whether you were uh, a chip company, uh, building hardware products, software company, building operating systems, applications, communication systems, we all had the same basic overriding mission. You know, productivity tools mm -hmm. for knowledge workers to make them more productive. And we watched that you know, in its evolution as the internet became commercial through the World Wide Web. But we're now in an era where something is different because we have been getting better and better at programming these tools to do more and more amazing things with Moore's Law, making everything cheaper and more powerful. But now it's different. And the difference is, now we're not just programming the systems. The systems are learning to understand all by themselves. And that's a fundamental change that is going on. That when you have what I call the data exhaust, the data exhaust is all this data that's coming out of cloud systems, and it'll be even more with 
uh, 50 billion wireless devices, some are projecting for Internet of Things. Well, there are only 7 billion people on the planet, so where's this data going with these devices? Well, it's machine to machine. And the machines are getting smarter. The mobile devices are getting, you know, more and more data is being generated. And so all of this data exhaust today, we <laughs> commercialize only a fraction of 1% of that data exhaust. And yet we're now getting to the point where the data exhaust is not about people sitting there writing code to program how to use the data exhaust more effectively. It's actually the machines getting smart enough with deep learning to learn themselves from the data. And so it started with predictive analytics. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I was uh, doing um, Bayesian statistical modeling and Markov chain analysis, Monte Carlo game theory. We thought it was all academic stuff, Tom. Well, now it's, you can actually do it. But that's just the beginning. The more interesting stuff is pattern recognition, uh, you know, looking at rule sets, looking at uh, machines that can actually go in and the more data they get, the more they learn from that, that, that data. And it's a dramatically different era that we're in. And so what I think about, because I'm not really a computer um, engineer, is I say, so what are the derivative effects? And the big derivative effect um, may surprise you. And that is, it's, it's going to reshape the entire middle class wherever you are in the world. And one little piece of that is that we saw how robots and smart machines replaced in manufacturing a lot of the heavy lifting blue collar jobs. Well, get ready, because we're now going to start to see a lot of the skilled white collar jobs being replaced by smart machines. There's a lot of economists that actually see a structural unemployment crisis coming, especially Andrew McAfee from MIT and others. Exactly, do yeah. You, do you agree with these? Well, he's predicted um, that we'll lose 5 million jobs between now and 2020. Yes. This actually put a number out there. Um, I'm speaking at MIT at, uh, on uh, Monday, and uh, you know, that's one of the things we'll be getting into is deep learning. And the reality is that it's a long time before we hit singularity. Uh, singularity uh, is, is really more about, you know, can, can the machines get beyond the Turing test and actually get smart enough that uh, they can be equivalent to a human being? And of course, Ray Kurzweil is the big promoter of that. Well, that means they've got to have judgment. And when you think of self-driving cars, uh, self-driving cars, absolutely a real industry. It's going to be huge, going to change a lot of things, as we've heard during this conference. But it's a long time before we get the judgment when the car can tell, you know, when the little kid you know, goes out in the street to pick up the ball that's rolling on the street, and over here is a baby carriage that a mother's uh, pushing along, which way does the car go? Does it run into the, the child getting the ball, or does it run into the baby carriage? You know, or the car coming behind it, you know, filled with kids, you know, that, that if they stop suddenly, it's going to hit it. So we don't have... Uh, we're not even close to replicating the judgment of a human being, but we are very close to deep learning that can handle a lot of the uh, kind of things that, that middle managers do. And it's going to radically change how we prepare people. So it used to be that you would go to college to prepare yourself to get a job. Now you go to college so you can be prepared to create a job. So one of the businesses I'm in is, is in the reinvention of work. And uh, the, the part we look at are what are called independent contractors. Well, in the early 1990s, less than 5% of the people in the U.S. worked for themselves. They were called 1099s. Uh, by 2015, that was 25% of the American workforce. The projections are by the year, uh, by 2015. By 2020, it's estimated it'll be 40% of the U.S. workforce will no longer work for an employer, they'll work for themselves. Well, the implication of that and the implication of smart machines coming in and taking jobs and the kinds of skills that you're gonna need in the workforce, uh, you know, the, it's the derivative effects of all of these technologies. Uh, Peter Diamandis has written a, a great book called Abundance about 
you know, all of these technologies. Singularity University. He's the yeah, Chancellor of Singularity University. All of these technologies are, are growing so fast, and it's not about scarce resources like you know, oil, water, and gas. It's about as much resources as we want getting cheaper and cheaper. And it's the derivative of effects. It's not the technology you should pay attention to. So when I wrote a book called Moonshot, it was about the derivative effect of all of that is that there's already been a market power shift from large incumbent employers in many industries, and it will go to every industry, where the power has shifted, not going to shift, it has already shifted, to customers. And customers now are paying more attention to the opinions of other customers just like them than they are to the advertising or the reputations of the legacy incumbents. And it explains why you see companies that have spent no money on advertising, you know, Uber, Airbnb, Facebook, you know, one after another, and yet they've grown into multi hundred billion dollar companies. And the reason is that the customers are so powerful today. And it's these derivative effects of technology. So when I think about uh, technology, I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about specific technologies. I look at how can you put a context to understand it. And the best context, I believe, Tom, is to, to say, how do we find really large customer problems, large scale problems that can be solved in a better way that are enabled by these technologies because we can just assume that over time they're going to become more and more commoditized. I think you're saying in your book this is the best time ever in history to build a big company. Well, uh, big in terms of value, not big in terms of employees. Okay. Uh, and that's the challenge because uh, the Silicon Valley model for decades has been the virtual model. And so you, you try to do things with as few people as possible. For example, one of the companies we started last year, uh, we went into the smartphone industry. and. Some people might say, why would you go into the most competitive industry in the world uh, where big international uh, corporations like Sony and, and HTC and Lenovo and LG are hemorrhaging hundreds of millions of dollars of losses a year? Microsoft buys Nokia's handset business for $7.2 billion uh, with 32,000 employees, lays off 18,000, then lays off another 10,000, then takes a $9 billion write-off. Why would anybody go into this industry? And the answer is because there are gaps even in commodity industries. And I've lived in commodity industries my whole working life. And we saw a gap where you could actually go and take the commoditization of technology if you work directly with the, the most uh, respectable vendors, you know, from Qualcomm to, to you know, Google to Dolby to um, Sony for camera modules and so forth, and you could actually design products. So we took the former design team that worked with me at Apple in Silicon Valley, and we designed smartphones that we can sell for hundreds of dollars less than anybody else. So we're down in the $100 US to $200 price point because we only have 100 employees in the whole company. We don't have 10,000 employees. And it's just a very typical Silicon Valley virtual model. So. Lots of new companies, some of them will be big, but they may not have, like Uber, I heard this morning, has 55,000 employees. Um, you know, not every company is going to get big and, and have that many people employed by it. Actually, a lot of people are saying now that too much money is rushing into the valley and that we actually have a new tech bubble. Do you, do you agree with that? Do you see that as a risk? Um, well, I, I, it's not like it was in the dot-com uh, era where Webvan and Pets.com were kind of the poster examples of you know, the failures at the, at the end of the, of, of the dot-com era. Uh, there are some very real legitimate companies that are being built you know, with some very sophisticated technology. You know, Palantir you know, is one in Silicon Valley. It's, it's worth over $20 billion and it's probably undervalued. Uh, there are, you know, Uber, it's a real company. It's worth everything that uh, it's, it's valued at, I believe. But, and you can find unicorns that are very real because they solve a big problem in a novel way and they have a business model to go with it. The problem is there are a lot of others that have kind of gotten you know, pulled along you know, by the momentum uh, that don't have business models, that don't make any money. Uh, and um, look at the struggle Twitter is having they have enough cash to last 412 years, 
you know, um, but they still haven't figured out a business model yet. Okay. And so uh, it, it's challenging, I think, if you are gonna solve a big customer problem, yeah, it's a good idea to try to figure out a business model that goes along with it. And, and some of these companies uh, have gotten big and maybe overvalued individually, but overall, I don't think we're looking at a, at a meltdown or a recession in the high-tech industry, no. If, if you look ahead the next few years, what industry or what part in tech or wherever excites you most, where you say, this is where you have to be now? Well, I believe <laughs> that you have to, it can be many different industries because these, this is an effect uh, of this power shift to customers in control. Uh, it's, it's crossing B2B, it's crossing um, you know, B2C industries. So it doesn't have to be a single industry, but the real value is going to be domain expertise. So the thing that Steve Jobs uh, taught me uh, when we spent so much time walking, he loves to walk around, he hated sitting at a desk in his office. And so we'd walk the Stanford campus or we'd walk you know, in Skyline above, above Silicon Valley and, and Steve would do zooming. And zooming was his description of saying you zoom out and you try to connect the dots between things that don't have an obvious relationship to the, each other. So um, at that time back in the 80s, the example that, that he loved was he loved beautiful calligraphy he had studied at, at Reed College. You know, uh, Wazit showed him how to build the first useful personal computer, the Apple II. And then he got, Steve got invited to Xerox Palo Alto Research Center where he saw the engineering workstations they were working on with the graphic user interface. But these were gonna be $80,000 machines. And so he connected the dots and said, wow, if you could take, you know, that graphic user interface and marry it together with, you know, the way we build products at Apple, which was, uh, very inexpensively, and then take all that beautiful calligraphy that I learned at Reed, and then actually you saw laser printing, be able to take the stuff that Adobe was starting to work on with um, you know, what would eventually become laser printing, and put that together and make it a creative tool. Nobody was thinking about creative tools for creative people. They were thinking about business tools or t engineering tools. And so he connected the, the uh, dots. And so that was called Zoom Out. And then he'd say, then you gotta zoom in. And the zoom in was all about the user experience, simplifying it, taking steps out. So I remember uh, an engineer would come up to Steve, it'd be you know, nine or 10 o'clock at night, we'd be hanging around in the Mac lab, and he'd proudly present a floppy disk to Steve and said, I got it down to six steps. And he'd want Steve to take a look at it. And Steve would take it and just throw it back at him, wouldn't even look at it. He said, uh, I don't want to see it, go do it in five steps. And he keep forcing the engineers to keep reducing the complexity. Now this is at the same time that the Japanese consumer electronic industry, which was all analog, was adding more and more features. And Steve said, the important decisions are not what you put in, it's what you leave out. It was always about simplification. And you can see that in the products that you know, Apple created under his leadership right up to the end of his life. Last question, you just told me you just came in from China. You're gonna give a speech on Monday at MIT, you're here now. So other people your age usually go play golf. Are you, any plans of slowing down anytime soon? No plan, no. Uh, well, first of all, what I do is not principally giving speeches, it just happens that I go to conferences uh, like this because I, I, I wanna learn. And you, you can only learn so much, you know, just, just reading or, you know, uh, staying with people, you know, who have been through it and may have been retired by this point. So actually, I don't know anybody who was in Silicon Valley back in the early 80s who's still doing what I'm doing. I mean, they're either dead or they're retired. Uh, and I don't want to do either of those two things. <laughs> so I'm very fortunate. My wife, Diane, is, is a mathematician in computer science. This, um, She's also my business partner in our family office, and we love, we only work with people we like. Hopefully they like us. Uh, we only work on transformative uh, businesses. Uh, we try to pick things that have noble causes to them, like helping revolutionize you know, healthcare, or um, you know, we're, we're interested in the reinvention of work and, and what happens to the middle class, to all these people who you know, 
are going to have to find all new kinds of skills and things like that. So we, we, we try to hang out with a lot of really you know, smart young people. Um, and um, no, I have no interest to go play golf. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. It was really insightful. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Thank you.